You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us once again. If this is your first time, please make yourself comfortable as we bring you Answers for the Family. Each week, this show will address issues such as family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, lasting health, and improving our world, and so much more. Now, having over 30 years experience working with families in crisis, I am grateful to have met and worked with some of the top professionals in many of the helping fields and skilled authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. And our guest today happens to be both. And you can all do me a big favor. Please check out some of our past shows at AnswersForTheFamily.com to hear some informative and entertaining guests, as well as some dynamic co-hosts discuss ways for you and your loved ones to become happier, healthier, and more at peace. I'm also looking for some show ambassadors who will forward at least one of our shows to your social media group or someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. I want you to know that this is a subject that you can forward to everybody because we will all benefit from it. And I want you to know that I truly appreciate it. And this is just another way that we can make a positive difference in the lives of others. Now, our topic today and the title of our guest's new book is The Story of More, How We Got to Climate Change and Where We Go From Here, which has been described as our guest's impassioned open letter to humanity as we stand at the crossroads of survival and extinction. Our guest, Dr. Hope Jaron, is an award-winning scientist who has been pursuing independent research in paleobiology since 1996, when she completed her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and began teaching and researching first at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and then at John Hopkins University. She is the recipient of three Fulbright Awards and is one of four scientists and the only woman to have been awarded both of the Young Investigator Medals given within the Earth Sciences. She was a tenured professor at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu from 2008 to 2016, where she built the Isotope Geobiology Laboratories with support from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the National Institute of Health. She currently holds the J. Tuzo Wilson uh, Professorship at the University of Oslo in Norway. Dr. Jaron, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Now, um, I think to start with, uh, we had a chance to talk a little bit before, um, but kind of give us a little bit of an overview in regards to um, what the book is about and why you felt compelled to write it now. Well, I turned 50 <laughs> just this <laughs> year. And um, four years ago, I had a book come out and it was about um, my life as a scientist. It was called Lab Girl. And it came out in 2016 and um, it was well received. And one thing that came out of that was that Time Magazine <clears throat> named me one of the most influential people, 100 most influential people of the year that year. And for a long time, I thought, um, what, what <laughs> did they pick right? What the heck happened? <laughs> Do I deserve this? I thought about that for a long time. And then I started thinking, well, that's not the question. The question is, if I do have influence, what am I going to do with it? And about that time, I was looking at turning 50. And I decided I wanted to figure out my life. I wanted to figure out what these 50 years have been. What does it mean to be alive during these 50 years, as opposed to the 50 that became, as opposed to the 50 that came before that? and the 50 that, you know, might come after us. And to do that, I'm a scientist. So to do that, I 
sat down at my desk and I looked at data sets. I looked at data sets from the Department of Energy and from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Census reports and the World Health Organization and all the different arms of the United Nation and newsletters from the Norwegian Fishermen's League. And I looked at the um, commercial aircraft uh, manufacturers and, and the Department of Transportation all these wonderful, wonderful private and public databases that I could get hold of telling me how things have changed the last 50 years. Um, how many eggs did a chicken produce in 1969 and how many eggs does your average chicken produce today? So facts upon facts. And I sat for years and sifted through it. And I divided what I found up into sort of a few different categories. You know, what had happened with people what had happened with the food supply, what had happened with the energy supply, and then what had happened to our earth. And I wrote it out as a story, uh, not a science book of facts, 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 and figures, 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 but the story of the last 50 years, how things change since I was a kid, maybe since you were a kid or, mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, it turned out to be the story of more because every single one of those indices, every single one, you know, not just population, but food, energy, mm -hmm. commuting distances, um, anything you could put your finger on, up, 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 those numbers have gone more, 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 even beyond what's required, even beyond what we're able to even throw away at this point. We saw more, we saw more, and now we're starting to see it really affect the earth. I wanted to tell that story and then I wanted to tell a story of how things could be different. Well, first of all, I want you to know how much I appreciate it. And you brought up in regards to how you chose to write the book. And that was one of the things that I really liked uh, was I didn't feel like I was reading a, a scientific uh, journal. I really felt like I was hearing the story of our country and the story of, of people that continue to pursue things and possibly not even possibly pursued too far. And, and so that's why I, I, I love it. That's why I wanted to have you on uh, share a little bit about the things that most people don't know, because I know that when I talk to anyone, uh, in fact, uh, um, before we had quarantine, uh, there was a lot of people at the gym that used to know that I would sit there and I would pedal and they would come up and ask me cause I'd have a book there and they'd say, okay, who's going to be on your show this time? What are you going to be talking about? <laughs> Um, well, so I still have people asking, but they ask questions usually about, you know, why did they write the book? What is going on? But when it comes to climate change, most people think, oh, well, don't we have to just stop factories putting out smoke or don't we just have to stop emissions coming from cars? I don't think that the average person realizes that it has to do with our food supply, that it has to do with the way in which we process food, that there's so many more things out there that play a huge part. Can you share some of those things that the average person doesn't follow because either the media or whomever chooses not to address it? Well, uh, we have a story. We have the story of our lives, and then we have the story that's been told to us, and they're not the same one. You know, um, the story that's been told to us is that things are getting better and better, um, that we've lived much more primitively. You know, 50 years ago, we didn't have as much good stuff, and now life is easier and better, and et cetera. Um, when you look at the data, you see a very, very different story. Um, and uh, what I also wanted to share with people was the numbers, not, mm -hmm. not written as numbers, but written as ways that we remember increase, right? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so here's a little bit about it. So population has doubled since I was a kid exactly 50 years ago. We all know that population's gone up, but mm -hmm. it's doubled. Right. However, what you might not know is that food production has tripled over that same period of time. So grain production has tripled, mm -hmm. meat production has tripled, sugar produ production has quadrupled, oh, yeah. and also energy consumption has tripled. So as we grew all that food, as we moved it around, as, we, as all those people started to travel, 
We also burned three times more fossil fuels, um, maybe four times more electricity we use now. And when it comes down to it, we're also making several more times the carbon dioxide that we used to make 50 years ago. And some of the things that scientists back in the 1800s predicted would come from excess carbon dioxide are certainly coming true. So simple things like warming, leading mm-hmm. to ice melting, leading to sea level rise. That's, that's a straightforward one, right? Warms up, ice melts, right. water goes into the ocean and sea level rises. So, so the book takes you through all of those things. And again, it is things that you might be aware were happening, but you might not know that the numbers are just so terribly big. For example, that what we produce energy-wise and food-wise vastly outruns the rate of population growth, that we've produced so much more than everyone needs and so much more that we actively throw away enough that we could all be using too much, mm-hmm. right? That, that, and that was a, a really interesting thing, I think, that most people don't know because we do live in a world where there's a billion people that are suffering quite badly without enough um, food, without enough shelter, and um, with no access to, to basic you know, electricity or sanitation. If we, just the amount of food that we throw away in North America, Europe, Japan, and Australia, and New Zealand, what we, what we refer to as the economically advantaged countries, just the amount of edible food that we throw away is enough to bring the amount of calories taken in by folks in um, those terrible positions, that 1 million that's suffering from undernutrition Mm -hmm. up to a level that's acceptable um, to the USDA. So 2000, between 2000 and 3000 calories a day. Right. And that was a big lesson to me while I was writing is that all of the suffering and want in the world doesn't come from the earth's inability to provide. It all comes from our inability to share. See, and I think that's a great point. Now, uh, there's some studying that I did and it, it suggested that there was a time when if you go back a hundred years that we started producing food and as we were doing it, we were producing, you know, food so that people would have enough calories. And that was the goal at that point when that was the focus before the focus became, um, a, a, a corporate profit, uh, bottom line of continuing to produce food, even though it may not be good for us, even though it may not be, um, being used. It's just being wasted. Uh, I know that there are other countries now that are setting up programs where if it's produced and it is taken to stores, it's taken to restaurants or whatever, that uh, uh, they can be fined or penalized uh, if they don't use it, if they don't get it to somebody, because there are plenty of people out there. Um, Talk a little bit about some of the things that we could do here to do the same thing in regards to Either, either cutting back on what it is that we're doing for things like, um, you know, like producing corn fructose and getting more into um, sustainable farms so that we're, we're bringing in healthier food, but also getting the food that is being wasted out to people that can actually use it. What would be some of the suggestions you would, you would want to see changed? Okay, so so two parts of that. So we can talk about corn, and corn has really changed since um, since I was a kid. Um, I grew up in Farm County in um, uh, Minnesota, and just surrounded by fields. And those fields all turned into corn somewhere between then and now. Uh, bushel of grain, which is about a fifty pound basket, right? It's it's a measure that's been in use for thousands of years. Uh, it's about what you could drag on a plane, right? 50 pounds. Yeah. It used to take a field the size of a basketball court to produce a bushel of corn. Now it takes just over a parking space. So there were massive 
technological advances throughout the 60s and 70s, largely, that increased the amount of food that we can grow per square foot of soil. And those increases have every crop I've looked up, and I've looked up hundreds of them, fruits and vegetables and grains, has exploded with respect to yield. Corn is a great example because we've got so much of it. Only 10% is eaten as corn. Now the rest, the other 90%, is split in half. Half of it is fed to animals, and the other half of it is now turned into fuel. So we ferment that and turn it into fuel for our cars and engines and things like that. So we're now at this point where we couldn't possibly eat all this corn. And in fact, of that 10% we eat, we've found a way to turn it into sugar. So we've turned it into sugar that has no nutrition. So calories without nutrition, that's another kind of insane product. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're driving tractors to plant corn. You're driving harvesters to harvest corn. You're fermenting that corn back into fuel and you're putting it back into engines so that you can drive those to plant crops or to get where you're going, et cetera. And so we have this incredible, it's almost a Mobius strip where we're going around and around and we've got so much food. We're, we're taking out the calories and, and eating it as, as junk. We're, we're turning it into fuel to further boost, you know, the amount of, um, uh, places we can go and the amount of pollution we're putting into the atmosphere. It's it, Our food uh, system has really, really gone overboard. Um, the other thing that I just touched on is that this grain and our ability to produce grain has tripled in the last 50 years, right? Mm-hmm. About 45% of that grain goes into animals to make meat. Right. right. And when you make meat, the the primary thing that's going on is it's it's a concentration factor thing. So and it's different for fish and pigs and cows and whatever. But as a general rule, you've got to feed an animal 10 pounds of grain in order to get one pound of edible meat. Now, for the rest of that grain, you get a bunch of poop, a bunch of pee. Um, you get whatever energy the animal used to walk around and do things, et cetera. Um, but you've, you've effectively thrown away the, the vast majority of the calories in that grain in order to get some meat out of it. So by, by um, cutting back a little bit on meat, you've actually freed up potentially down the chain an awful lot of grain. And if you go even further back, an awful lot of energy. Now, the amount of meat that we eat this has has also exploded, right? So if we even went back to the level of meat that they recommended after World War II, sort of 3.18 pounds per family of four per week. By the way, that's the amount of meat a lot of people eat every single day. If we went back to that, we could free up about 20% of the global grain supply for other uses. Now, so it's now, it's really amazing the the numbers at this now, point. Now, c- couldn't we also um, gain that benefit and more by just shifting over to a grass fed meat, so that these are now animals that are that are grazing the way in which they used to, rather than being fed this corn, which eventually, once it becomes their meat, and once we eat their meat, we're actually eating more corn again. <laughs> you know, so right, right. So you're bringing up an important part of this, and that's how the meat is made. Mm-hmm. So you can make the meat by feeding corn to a cow. You can make the meat by letting the cow access grass. Um, and then there's all kinds of different issues of you know everything from animal cruelty to the health and safety of the people who work with the animals to the amount of land that they impact and whose land and all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certainly better and worse ways to treat both the animal and the land while you make this, but I don't think we can continue con- to consume meat at the rate that we're consuming it, regardless of how it was made. So okay. yes, switching over to a meat that was made using a kinder process to the earth or to the animal based on your values 
is a great thing to do, but eating less of it is an even better thing to do in my well, eyes. Or, or both. So the idea is, is that you want to really make a difference, do both. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. And it, we're doing so terribly much. It's, it's amazing how, how little those values have to change. Uh, I've done a lot of calculations for this book, but basically if we all went back to a lifestyle that is the food and energy use of the average person in 1965 Switzerland. Okay. So you have to use a little bit of your imagination to, to figure out what that's like. Look at some pictures, you know, mm-hmm. ask some, if you know some Swiss folks, ask them what life was like back then. Um, I always, I think that's a, even if you haven't been to Switzerland, I think that's a, a better way to tell the story than by giving cold numbers. If, if we could go back or if we could adopt a simple lifestyle, not not one of, of suffering, you know, 1965 Switzerland, we could share that level of food consumption and energy consumption with every single person on the earth, all 7.4 billion people. There would be enough energy and food mm-hmm. for everyone to live at that level. So it's it's we're not actually faced with having to make terrible, terrible sacrifices in order to build a better world. Well, there's, there's something that I've done on the show a variety of times and people have commented on it that they liked it. So let me do the same with you. I'm going to give you a magic wand. Okay. With that magic wand, you now get to make three huge changes on the earth in, in this area or whatever area you choose. What do you do? Wow, that's that's a tough. That's a tough one. I would. Hmm. I okay. So I wrote a book called "The Story of More," mm-hmm. and I kind of came up with a mantra as I was studying all these things, that the solution inevitably was not just doing things differently, but doing less. You just have to consume less. So I would put smaller gas tanks into cars. I would put smaller uh, servings of food onto plates. I would put smaller um, allotments of groceries into packages. <laughs> I would, you know, I would make, um, yeah, which would make us smaller, <laughs> number one. Which so I think going toward benefit. less, less is, is one thing. I would focus very strongly on creating better system quality between men and women around the world because my examination of the data showed that that will be the most effective way to decrease population growth. In countries where the gap between male and female opportunity, economic Mm -hmm. and political, in countries where that gap is very small, not just rich countries, but poor Mm -hmm. countries, those are the countries where we see women having fewer births in their lifetime and families being smaller. And so if we change women's status to be more equal to the men in their lives, we're going to see that um, that curbing of population growth that we're trying to get at through so many other ways. Um, I really believe that that is that that's the the solution that we sort of haven't tried yet, that that's the critical part, part there. Um, I still have one wish left, right? Sure. I would get rid of all cars. I hate cars. I just (laughs) hate cars. There's a whole chapter on how I hate cars. Um, I hate cars because I have such terrible luck with cars. I know you're broadcasting from LA, which is car city, right? Yeah. I hate, I hate cars because I've never owned a good one. I, and I've never known anybody who had a good one. We had one when I was a kid that my mom, my mom would tense up when we left the city limits because she honestly would say, we can't drive this thing any further than we can walk home. 
And when we got to about that level, she, she would, the last car I bought didn't make it home from the deal. It broke before it came home from the dealership. Right. So I, you know, cars have just, I've seen them hurt by love. When I got my driver's license, they came for me and they began to systematically ruin my life. Um, so I had no, I had no real problem writing <laughs> a chapter about cars and how uh, the world might be a better place if there weren't so many of them. Right. And if we weren't stuck in them for so many hours a day. So the average American, men, women, children, spend on average an hour a day in their car. Uh, and that is an hour that we can't get back for other things. Actually, I think people that are staying home right now Yes. And that's one thing I hear from a lot of people is I'm busy. I get my work done, but somehow I have more time. And I think it might have come from the time they used to spend behind the wheel. I think that's a great point. And, um, and I like the fact that in, in what's going on now, um, rather than and sit at home, get upset, woe is me. Uh, or in fact, the other thing is for people, if you're at home, Turn off the news, okay? Stop watching the news and contact family members. Use technology for the things that it is. We're on Zoom right now. You can set up a Zoom meeting with your friends. You can set up a Zoom meeting or Skype meeting with your family. Um, we have FaceTime on our phones. So for those, those that want to talk to their grandchildren or their children or their siblings or whatever, you can do still do all of those things. And I've had quite a few people that have said that, you know, they're really trying to focus on the positive things that we can get out of this. Uh, so. Especially I'm, your older um, friends and, and relatives, you know, yeah. they might really be staying home and not getting out much and, and just an hour of uh, gossip about the neighbor's cat, I think, or five minutes of gossip. Yeah. About the neighbor, anything, anything is just um, going to really tickle their fancy. Um, if yes. you, uh, that's been my experience, um, just checking in with people you know, during I, the I, course of the day. I couldn't agree more. Um, I spoke with a friend yesterday, which had some great ideas because uh, we know that Easter is coming up very soon. And so what the neighborhood has done is, is that they're putting pictures of uh, Easter eggs up in the windows of mm -hmm. each house. Mm -hmm. And, and so I guess when it's coming up here, or maybe it's next Sunday or the Sunday after. Anyway, that when families will go out as a family and not interacting with other people, but they can go by and take pictures of the other houses and stuff. And they're encouraging the families to, to take pictures with their kids and then go back and talk about whose house had which picture, and maybe set up prizes that the family can give to their own kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, get creative. Think of ways in which you can still be a community, but at the same time, you know, keeping your social distancing. Yeah, we've got, luckily, we've got a cat here with way too much personality and he runs around <laughs> the street doing whatever he wants. And <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's nice to, it's nice to know your neighbors, even if you have to do it from from a few feet further away nowadays. But mm -hmm. this won't last forever. It won't last forever. Well, um, we have some uh, questions that have come in. So, and again, I want to thank those that take the time to do this. Um, I know that uh, for for many of you, um, you know, you're, you're taking away from something else to send us in um, some questions. So again, we appreciate it. Now, this one reads, it says, I was just reading an article featuring a study called the Montreal Protocol based on a 1987 agreement to stop producing ozone depleting substances. It stated that this could be responsible for pausing or even reversing some troubling changes in air currents uh, around the Southern hem Hemisphere. Um, at, uh, a chemist from University of Colorado Boulder was quoted as saying, uh, you know, we term this. Uh, as a pause because the poleward um, circulation trends might resume, stay flat or reverse. The article ended by saying that the Montreal Protocol is proof that if we take global and immediate action, 
we can help pause or even reverse some of the damage we've started. Uh, yet even now, the steady rise in greenhouse gas emissions is a reminder that one such action is simply not enough. Can you comment on this? And this is from Joseph in Alabama. Right. So the Montreal Protocol is often put forward as one of the huge success stories of the environmental movement, and it certainly was. Um, there was a lot of fortunate things that came together. It's a really interesting history, um, not the least of which was that it was a very clear kind of smoking gun for the couple few sets of chemicals that were doing all the damage. And uh, manufacturers, you know, it was kind of it was the right problem at the right time. Political scenario was such that people just really got on board. They were able to develop alternative technologies. People were, consumers were happy enough to, to use hairspray in a pump bottle as opposed to, as opposed to a charged bottle, you know, that that was a very easy cultural shift to make. Um, and uh, in good order that, that, was turned around to a great degree. I mean, it's it's really great model for how a success story like that can happen. Um, and your your um, caller writer, <laughs> yeah. your your listener is exactly right that that is something to hold up as a positive sort of role model for how we can change things. There's a couple things about the current climate debate that a current climate um, problem global warming that are a little more complicated in that it's a lot more diverse set of um, emissions mm -hmm. that are causing this and that those emissions come from a much more diverse set of activities. So with ozone, we could go back to chlorofluorocarbons and those were associated with a few processes, et cetera. But what goes back to warming is a lot more stuff. But exactly the three magic pieces that global cooperation um, industrial cooperation mm -hmm. and consumer flexibility, um, just as your listener says, those are the three magic components of really making a difference. But the consumer is a huge piece of that. Okay. Well, um, can we make, can we go over a list? I know you touch on some things in your book, but what are some of the things that the individual can do? And, and one of the reasons why I want to bring this up and for those that are, that are, um, regular listeners of the show, uh, I had a young woman that I met on, um, I, I met her actually at an uh, Oscar party and it, uh, she flew in for that and then flew back to her point. She walked from the East coast to the West coast uh, to prove a point, but also to make sure that people understood that this was for mother earth. She, she has a nonprofit, but what I liked and part of her message was this is one person because people, I constantly hear people say, well, I'm just one person. What can I really do? Um, mm -hmm. There are things that we can do. So share some of the things and you don't have to, my point is you don't have to walk from the East coast to the West coast to draw attention, to set up, uh, you know, renewable energy or to set up, um, um, you know, special uh, farms, you know, in special areas so that food can get to people better. That's healthier. Mm -hmm. There are other things you can do, but we have to keep realizing that that's not the right answer. It can't be anymore. Well, what can I do? What can I do? Share some of the things that we can all do. Right. Okay. So I talk a lot about more, the story of more. And so mm -hmm. I talk a lot about how less is, is kind of the answer, yeah. right? I mean, it makes mm -hmm. sense, right? If we've yep. had too much more, we need less. And there's no free lunch. There's no new product or approach or technology that's coming to save us. We just cannot consume at this rate. So one great thing to do is to, to start thinking about wh what are these things that I feel locked into that are actually optional? Some of the ways you use energy and food are not optional. You know, you may have to get mm -hmm. um, certain places or, you know, like your friend, you can't walk to dinner parties across the country. <laughs> but you'll find, and especially now if you're working at home, you're finding that there's some stuff that you used energy that you miss and there's some stuff that you just don't, mm -hmm. right? So if there is, you know, this is a terrible crisis and people are, you know, hurting and dying and grieving and we want it to be over. That's what we want, the end. Mm -hmm. But after that happens, we're going to be able to have some interesting discussions around all that stuff that we used to do. How much of it ended up being optional? Great point. So 
so so when you look at your own life, and I do believe it, it starts with people evaluating their own lives. I have colleagues, I have a lot of scientific colleagues that work with climate change, and they're very focused on policy. They really mm-hmm. push to say nothing right. will ever happen until we get governments to outlaw this or put these kind of restrictions on companies or um, make these kind of regulations or put carbon taxes on X, Y, Z. I see what they're saying. My problem with it is those policies have not happened. I've heard them say that for a long time. Those policies are not being adopted. We are further away from people examining those policies than we used to be. Mm -hmm. So I much more favor a, I don't want to call it a bottom up approach because I don't think the people of the world are are the bottom. I think we're the thing, (laughs) you know? And I think if we lived in a world where people understood how much energy they used and understood what kind of energy they were choosing to use when they make their choices. So food and energy, basically hundreds of little choices you make every day. If you made those choices differently, you'd have a lot different pattern. So we already talked about, you know, one meatless day a week, only meeting, eating meat once once a day, that frees up a tremendous amount of resources down the line, right? So, and, and we get polarized in these conversations. This is another problem too, is is we think it's about, you know, you have to be a self-declared vegan or an omnivore or a pescador or a, yes, but there's a lot of area in between all those things, right? Eating meat whenever you can see it is very different than eating meat once a week. Mm -hmm. Um, is very different than promising to be a vegan and go that extra mile every single time you want to find a snack, right? There's, there's lots of room in between for us to adopt a better way. Um, What you also find is that people want to conserve energy. They want to conserve, but they just don't know how, how do you get the biggest bang for your buck? If you were going to turn off one thing in your house to save energy, what would it be? Um, should I stop watching Netflix so much? Should I make sure the lights are off? Should I? And actually, it all goes down to things that heat and cool. Um, like your water heater is probably the biggest energy user in your home. You might not know that. So if you can get a smaller one, if you can stop washing with hot water, your clothes and stuff, if you can stop taking hot showers, just warm showers, just really quick ones, you can save an awful lot of energy that way. And in fact, in my book, I talk about um, just playing with the thermostat and your watt hotter he- your watt hot water heater, just playing with those dials, not turning them off, not getting rid of them, just playing with those two sets of dials, not buying solar panels, not by changing everything. Just mm-hmm. by playing with those two sets of dials, you can stop using about 70% of what you've been using. These are These are not... These are not um, negligible changes we're talking about. And then I believe that once people change their daily lives, they can start to look at their workplace or their children's school and say, well, why does it work that way? Does it need to? Um, They can say from a point of experience, you know, can we change? Can we change the way we do things at places where we gather? Can we change our institutions? Um, can we put pressure on the people who make very large institutions? And I'm very hopeful about, I'm much more hopeful about that approach than I am about waiting for the powers that be to buy into a policy that won't make anybody in their circle rich. Well, I, I, I love everything that you've put in there. And I think that now in relation to the powers to be, I think part of the way to approach that is um, for people to find out how their local politician voted on something. Did they vote to continue a subsidy to big agriculture and send something to them that says, we're not going to vote for you as long as you subsidize big agriculture, as long as you subsidize big pharma, as long as you subsidize big oil. Um, If you continue to vote for subsidizing those, we are, you know, we're going to put somebody else in there 
that will stop doing that. So I think that if we can hit on a lot of different areas, and I love the fact that individually we can do a lot of things, which by doing that, by, by not eating meat, eventually they're going to have to change. And, you know, it's, you know, you can't continue to produce something if nobody's going to buy it. So if, if you eat 20% less, you're going to produce 20% less. So, um, but I think that we can do all of the above. Yeah. So I've been talking about our power as consumers. And I should also mention that um, a lot of us, an awful lot of us have power as shareholders too. Um, okay. Now with uh, finances in flux, it's a great time to look at, you know, mutual funds and, and, you know, these big agglomerations that take into account so many mm -hmm. different investments. You know, if you comb through that, there might be stuff in there that you really don't want to support that you really don't want to be part of that business. And it takes, you know, <laughs> honestly, that's why they bundle them in these weird ways, right? Yep. Um, it, it, it's, it's so, and, and it just, it's for you, right? It doesn't make sense for you to spend part of your life working towards an earth that you want and have your money, your retirement at the same time working on a vision of the earth that you absolutely don't want. So I really, point. I really encourage people to look, to look through their finances and um, talk to the, to the people that have helped them invest and work out, you know, is there anything in there that's really working against your values? Um, because there are so many choices and we're not just consumers. Um, a lot of us are actually part of, of, um, the companies themselves as, mm -hmm. as supporters and shareholders. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. And so for anybody out there, if you are a hedge fund manager, if you, if you are a broker, um, you know, you can make a difference that way. And for everybody that has money with that broker or with that hedge fund manager, ask them, you know, in whatever mutual fund that they have them in, ask them what companies are involved in that. And if it's a company that is not, uh, something that you support, tell them that you'll find a different broker if they don't make a choice, if they don't make a change and start as you were saying, and, and, you know, when you're saying from the bottom up, but you're right, we're not the bottom, but we are the masses. And if we start telling the brokers and the brokers tell the hedge fund manager and the hedge fund manager says, we're moving the money to these other places, I think we can make a difference. Uh, and, and we can hit on all, on all of those fronts. I think there's a whole niche for financial advisors that are um, values-based investors, yes. you know, that work with you to find out what your values are, um, that you believe in nutrition or you believe in, because there are so, so many different ways um, to invest in our, in our very detailed system that um, I think, I think somebody could, could make a nice little niche at, at just being able to, to, put people in a place where they feel confident that their assets are working um, toward the same future that, that their everyday labor does. Mm -hmm. um, so for anybody out there, if you're a broker and you want to increase your business and you want to go after the sustainable value-based uh, clients, uh, give me a call. We'll put you on the show and you can tell people the changes you're going to make so that you can build your business. And then if you build your business with it, others will see and others will follow. So that's a great idea. Thank you, Hope. I love that. All right. So uh, I'm checking the time real quick. And we have about four minutes. Um, I think we had another, um, another question that came in. Uh, via instant message. And this one reads, um, okay. Um, oh, yes. Um, uh, a new show flashed a satellite view of China that showed a 25% drop in pollution in that country alone since the epidemic hit. Uh, I feel it is time for people to speak out about being really cautious on how we invest. They're they're either listening to what we were saying or, or they were um, thinking along the same lines uh, and we stimulate our, our regional economies with regard to sustainability and sustainable incentives. My family owns commercial and 
uh, residential real estate, and we plan to do our part by installing high-efficient heat pumps and uh, electric chargers in our buildings to start. It says, I personally would also like us to add rooftop solar panels, uh, which we will do over time. This is from Mary Ann in North Carolina. What's your thoughts on this? I think this is a great time to to reflect and say, is this how we want to live? And what are our possibilities for living differently? And it sounds like that's exactly what Marianne is doing. Mm -hmm. And I wish her all the best. It seems like she's on some great roads. I, I, I hope she'll consider um, bringing home a copy of my book um, because it brings all these issues up. Again, um, food, health, uh, energy use, climate, and it doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you what you can do. And it's up to you to, to go from there. What, what parts of it inspire you? You'll know more than you did before you read it. But what your opinion is, how you judge it, and what you do with it, that's up to you. And I really hope you'll, you'll give it a try and find something good in there. Now, speaking of the book, um, share with us um, where people can find it. Is it at all book outlets? Uh, is it better to go directly to your website? What is the best way for them to do that, as well as just if they want to follow you and learn more about what you're doing? Yes, it is called The Story of More. You can learn more about it at thestoryofmore.com. Again, I'm just thankful to uh, to be able to help get the word out because that's what we need is we need more people that are looking at things and saying, we can make a difference rather than saying, well, I'm just one person. Well, you're one person, but with this book, I think you're going to make a huge difference. And I just want to thank you. Well, you bet. I'm a scientist and that's my job and I'm happy to do it. And thank you for having me today. You're very welcome. And for everybody out there, be sure and put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we are joined by Deborah Lott, author of Don't Go Crazy Without Me. It's a story of living with a parent who went from neurotic to full-blown psychotic. (laughs) Um, And uh, in the interview, Deborah will share how her very close bond with her father almost plunged her into the same full-blown psychosis. Now, for everybody out there, please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com or subscribe to our show through iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Speaker, SoundCloud, and Facebook Live, Oh, as well as iHeartRadio. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, the next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please stop by our page, check out some of our latest posts. If you like them, please like us and spread the word. And again, I highly recommend that you get Hope's book. And after you get it, uh, through whatever source you get it from, leave a review. That is one of the best ways that you can pay, pay a compliment to any author that has taken, as in her case, years to write this book. Uh, leave a review so that uh, they know what you think of it. Um, it will also help other people that would be looking for a similar book know that this is exactly what they would like to find. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza right here on LA Talk Radio.